International trade and a good faith exchange of ideas can be beneficial to all. Economic and political globalization, however, has been destructive to authentic cultures. Industrialized countries are being transformed into great nothings and nowheres. Indistinguishable concrete dumping grounds and shopping centers, divorced from culture, people, and history. Globalization threatens not just Europeans, but every unique identity on Earth. This is the part where I explain how state bad. That states dictate the terms by which people may voluntarily exchange internationally in ironically named free trade agreements. That artificial scarcity created by government central planning into resource management and production forced people to work longer to maintain their lifestyles. How the government monopolizing finance through central banking creates the boom and bust cycle that incentivizes consumer spending through credit expansion while threatening people's material interests in times of economic recession. How, over a prolonged period of time, artificial scarcity drives people towards materialism by keeping people busier than ever working and ensuring they have no time for creative, charitable, philosophical, or spiritual pursuits. How the incentives produced by industrialization create mass marketing, which makes brands stale and lifeless, to avoid offending consumers, which is why cultures deluged by consumerism lose their distinctiveness. Mass marketing being an incentive of states incentivizing mass production and industrialization for the purposes of creating raw production, which states can in turn tax, allowing them to build larger, more powerful armies with which they may threaten other states. But I think you already know most of this, dear viewer. Leftism is an ideology of death and must be confronted and defeated. Losing gracefully will eventuate in the destruction of our people and civilization. Leftism doesn't exist. There is no coherent set of principles or ideas that could possibly be associated with the leftist descriptor that could not also be associated with rightism or centrism equally as easily. The political spectrum as a whole is an anti-concept that actively obscures our understanding of philosophy and manipulates people into studying societies as a set of policy prescriptions imposed from the top down rather than as a social science. People in general are moral agents, they have the ability to choose, and will act otherwise than how the hard sciences or just positivism in general would otherwise dictate they ought to behave. A planet moves around in predictable and understandable patterns, and it cannot choose, it cannot act contrary, and will never respond to incentives. People will. That's why treating social organization, including economics, as a hard science is always going to fail. This is known as methodological dualism. Economic freedom is not an end in itself. All economic policies should serve the people of the nation. The interests of businessmen and global merchants should never take precedence over the well-being of workers, families, and the natural world. We already discussed this in part one. Their desire to impose policy prescriptions dictating how people ought to use their own resources is a claim on the bodily autonomy the individuals used to acquire those resources in the first place. This is slavery by another name, and until the alt-right can do as I asked earlier and demonstrate the state has a higher claim to myself than I do, then nothing about this point Spencer is making could ever be called knowledge. The proper term for it would be megalomania. Now we're just into the second month of 2020. The alt-right has petered out as a movement, so it is understandable that some of you, dear viewers, watching this video may regard them as a historical footnote, or even associate these ideas with other groups such as Nick Fuentes' America First. Yet as briefly as I went over this topic, you should really pay attention here, because the rhetoric used by the alt-right, particularly on economics, is now the mainstream position of the controlled opposition faction of American politics called conservatism calls for a politically prescribed economy that is willing to sacrifice freedom for the well-being of workers is espoused openly by conservative mouthpieces like Tucker Carlson and Steve Dace. These charlatans don't understand what an economy even is. It's individuals making choices to meet their most highly valued preferences. What this entails is that any one individual is actively participating in dozens of economies simultaneously as every continent, every region, every street, every household has its own economy, the needs of which are in constant flux, and the equilibrium of any set of supply and demand curves shifting dynamically minute after minute.
Economies do not exist in a vacuum. Economies are not entities external to its participants that can be made to or not to serve the people. Now, we can all agree that people are not able to meet their most highly valued preferences today. And because we know that people are incentivized to do so, this failing to manifest is due to outside interference. More specifically, when you take the economic calculation problem to its logical conclusion, the very existence of economic policies undermines property rights. And without property rights, you can't have prices, which makes knowing how to allocate resources most efficiently impossible. As explained earlier, economic policy entails claims to other people's resources and ownership over the labor used to get those resources in the first place. The fact that the alt-right and 2020's conservatards claim that it's for their little version of the greater good doesn't justify slavery. The reason whether or not it is slavery matters is because without justifying their claims to other people's property, nothing they do can be called knowledge, as stated earlier. Without knowledge, as with the economic calculation problem, all resource allocation is pure guesswork, making allocation equally as likely to serve the interests of the people, global merchants, or even serve the interests of crayfish in Maryland. And as they have no basis for correcting their errors, resource misallocation away from where they would be used most efficiently is assured. The automobile, the highway system, and resultant car culture have contributed to the death of cities and towns. While not everyone will live in urban environments, cities are vital institutions of culture, community, learning, and the arts. They should never have been abandoned by American whites of older generations and should be reestablished as jewels of our civilization. Ooh, you'll never guess what caused car culture, government policy. More specifically, the appropriation of roads and highway building as public property. As part of Cold War preparation and buildup, the United States government set to building roads in preparation for the movement of troops and tanks across the United States in the event of Soviet invasion. The interstate highway system was designed to be runways for air travel hidden in plain sight. The result has been to create a surplus of roads that might have otherwise existed in a market and creating artificial demand for cars by significantly lowering the cost of transportation. In many ways, the government's monopoly on road production has been one giant subsidy to the automobile industry. As for cities, it's not terribly surprising what happened. In the days of their foundation, they were trade hubs, usually situated on major ports, intersections between trade routes, canals, what have you. As the cost of moving goods from freight to shop were very high, it paid to have your storefront in close proximity to where they would be offloaded. This is doubly true for your workforce, who couldn't drive to work due to the technology not existing yet. This limited urban sprawl while encouraging the consolidation of infrastructure and people into higher density concentrations. Or, to put it more simply, geography encouraged human density. Their high population density, of course, did make them hubs of artistic and cultural development. After all, that's where all the people and consumers are. Just to be clear, this is not necessarily the result of government. Certainly it could have incentivized urbanization, but the exact nature of these incentives is unknown to me, and the geography explanation is still quite reasonable. But what makes cities interesting now is that they're an anachronism, a relic of a soon-to-be bygone age of capital-intensive, concentrated, and centralized production, both geographically and economically. Now that goods are able to be transported anywhere cheaply, and the means of production are now exceptionally less capital-intensive, consolidation and centralization are becoming economic liabilities. Huge firms have no hope of competing with hundreds of smaller firms, especially as more and more production is able to be done by individuals over the internet. Commuting to work can now be done by walking to your computer rather than spending two hours a day in traffic jams or walking two miles on foot. People can now live anywhere and have just as much earnings potential as if they lived anywhere else. Given unprecedented freedom of choice in geography, that as many people who do today would voluntarily choose to live in cities is improbable. Cities are a relic of mercantilist and industrial society and belong in museums. We are a special part of the natural order, being in it and above it. We have the potential to become nature's steward or its destroyer. 
Putting aside contentious matters like global warming and resource depletion, European countries should invest in national parks, wilderness preserves, and wildlife refugees, as well as productive and sustainable farms and ranches. The natural world, in our experience of it, is an end in itself. The same problem as before, a set of policy prescriptions inherently parasitic to the very people Spencer says he wants to help to fulfill a personal preference. Environmental concerns are genuine concerns, but are a problem of, you guessed it, the government. Where do we even begin? The extent to which the government prevents people from being able to seek damages from pollution entering their property. How the state steals land and is unable to manage its resources due to the nature of centralized control, preventing them from being able to be used efficiently, coming to a head with the greatest environmental catastrophes in history, including the Animus River, the Darvaza gas crater, Chernobyl, and Lake Karachay? How war results in huge consumption and destruction of resources? How the state actively impedes people from being able to defend their own property? And how it stops others from using their own resources to clean up environmental disasters? I could go on, but this topic is worth a video on its own. Suffice to say, it has all the same incentive problems I described earlier. The state does not care about the environment, no matter what their rhetoric. Also, one other thing, the burden of proof about the natural world and our experience of it being an end unto itself, you need to demonstrate that. Moving on. The generation born between 1945 and 1964 abrogated its duty to safeguard and pass down a civilization to its children. The so-called 68ers engage in childish narcissism of the most extreme kind. They bear responsibility for today's lamentable state of affairs, and they are seemingly unable even to recognize their culpability. A new generation of leadership is desperately needed. The baby boomers. I have nothing kind to say about their ilk, as people who know me would attest. However much it hurts me to say, the problem is not necessarily the baby boomers. It's the existence of rulership that allows the worst, most childish and narcissistic tendencies of the baby boomers, or any generation or one person, to become institutionalized. Spencer's whole argument assumes the problem of state rule can be chalked up to bad agents. Insinuating that the critic of political rule is not making observations as to how its method of organization encourages its agents into becoming bad apples, that the problem is not that the system encourages its employees towards predatory behavior, simply removing the predators somehow solves the problem. Spencer is being circled by wolves, and thinks that if he just replaced the wolves with their cubs, that things will turn out better. And, for a time, they probably will. But Spencer doesn't realize that the problem with the wolf pups is that eventually, they'll grow up. Modern education, from preschool to the doctoral level, has become corrupted past the point of recognition. This industry, both public and private, serves leftist ideologues, loan financiers, and a new class of administrators far more than it serves students and parents. Children should not be indoctrinated in liberal dogma, but given a foundation in language, mathematics, the arts, history, and science. Higher education, far from being a right or a pathway to the middle class, is only appropriate for a cognitive elite dedicated to truth. It is improper, even detrimental, for most. Practical education, trade schools, and apprenticeships should be revived as the norm for most citizens. Government schools were designed by Johann Gottlieb Fichte in post-Napoleonic War Prussia, specifically to break the minds of the young, forcing them into military-style regimentation, a process specifically designed to instill blind obedience in authority figures. By handing out imaginary rewards called grades, teachers establish themselves as these authority figures to be obeyed. The system decides what kids study, what to think about a given subject, and how long to study it for, while preventing kids from learning how to evaluate information themselves, keeping them ignorant while making them and their abusers believe with all sincerity that they are being educated. Creativity, innovation, curiosity, and skepticism are stifled in favor of conformity and uniformity. It's an institution designed with the specific purpose of grinding down the mind of a person and breaking them mentally to be remolded into the perfect automaton for an industrial era status society. People, in the loosest sense of the term, with no drive, life, direction, or passion. No will or agency of their own aside from how their schoolmasters wish them to act utterly devoid of humanity, and willing to be killed to profit their uncaring and capricious overlords, because otherwise they may question their order givers.
it was imported into other countries by deranged, maladjusted sociopaths like Horace Mann and John D. Rockefeller in the United States with nothing but the worst of intentions, knowing exactly what the Prussian model entailed and what it would do to millions of kids, which is why they spent so much effort to make these prison camps for kids compulsory. All because they just wanted better, more productive workers. I will give my past self some credit in mentioning something important about modern education, though. It's working exactly as intended. It's when kids actually learn to evaluate information critically and are able to determine for themselves their own interests that schooling has failed. But I am certain Spencer doesn't care about any of this. In fact, I suspect he knows about all of this. His problem is that it indoctrinates kids with the wrong ideas, that families are coerced to engage in systematic child abuse by sending their kids to prison camps to be physically and mentally traumatized by their peers and government agents, forcing them to believe absolute nonsense is not seen as an unforgivable evil to be opposed and undermined, but a tool to be utilized. The problem is not they're being forced into a cult, is that they're being indoctrinated into the wrong cult. If Spencer is opposed to schooling, great. I doubt he is, but I've been surprised before. A man distinguishes himself by his deeds, and every man, in his own way, must strive to be something more than a man, to be honored by his peers, to be sort of something greater than himself. Which is exactly what I'm doing. I want to be free. And that's that. It was interesting to go back to my old work and see how far I've come intellectually, but also pretty cringy, which is why I couldn't bring myself to include clips of the 2017 video in here, but if you want to see for yourself, there's a link in the description, as well as a link to the whole list on altright.com. Speaking of, it's a, a dead website. They haven't had a new article in three years. Kind of fitting for the carcass of a movement being feasted upon by other neo-reactionary groups, but how much more is there to say about Richard Spencer and the alt-right I haven't already covered in my various responses? They're just another form of authoritarian collectivism that wants to control you. Whether or not your enslavers are oasis isn't really important either, is it? Those of you who recall that criticism of the alt-right. But it's not surprising they existed in the first place. Remember what I said about geography having less importance economically? People are not only fleeing cities, but countries to more favorable legal jurisdictions or even to escape states altogether. Those who benefit from the status quo of state dominion, either financially or ideologically, have an incentive to adopt nationalism as their clarion call, demanding that state do everything it can to restrict people's ability to pursue their interests since new technology now enables people to undermine the state by pursuing said interests, and those who currently perceive a benefit from state dominion, the patriots, the welfare queens, oh no, they can't have that. If you, dear viewer, are free, who's going to pay for their chicken tendies? The only thing I can really think of left to remark on is the nature of the Unite the Right rally. The very nature of protesting means the rally's goal was doomed to fail from the very beginning. Can you imagine anything more cucked than begging the state to preserve your history? What about preserving the history of the actions taken by people you've never met? Questions? Comments? Critique? What are your recollections of the alt-right? Has your view of them altered? Leave a comment below. Like, share, and subscribe to become a heretic today.